All right, so we're going to be looking at a an analytical technique this week to determine the identity of a compound in the lab. And the technique we're going to be looking at today is something called mass spectrometry. And it uses an instrument called a mass spectrometer. Here's an instrument lab for you. Um, in order to analyze molecules for their ultimate identity. Now, usually when we want to elucidate, elucidate the total identity of a compound in organic, um, we use more than one analytical technique. So throughout your organic experience, we're going to learn three different analytical techniques to go from not knowing what a compound is or having maybe only um, knowledge of what the atoms are in the compound, but nothing else, um, to understanding the complete identity. The first thing we're going to do, and this is this week, is we're going to be talking about the mass spectrometer and how the mass spectrometer takes a compound, an organic compound, and tells us the molecular weight of that compound through a mass spectrum. And once we have the molecular weight, we're going to be able to calculate a molecular formula. We might be able to gain some other information about the molecule as well from a mass spectrum, but we're going to keep it pretty simple. As you go through your um, chemistry courses, mainly analytical and instrumentation, you'll learn more about mass spec most of the time. Mm, we will eventually get to infrared spectrometry, which uses the absorbance of infrared light to vibrate bonds at different frequencies to tell us which functional groups are in the compound. Um, and then ultimately, we are, from knowledge of the molecular formula and which functional groups are in the compound, we're going to run something called nuclear magnetic resonance. This is a little later on in organic, but um, in nuclear magnetic resonance or NMR spectroscopy, we're going to be able to use radio waves to probe different nuclei inside of a hydrocarbon compound, and we can do proton or carbon NMR, and that data that we get back from the information on the NMR will tell us the, the atom connectivity of maybe which protons are connected to which carbons in which positions, which will ultimately give us the t entire structure or the, the known identity of that compound. And so we're going to be talking about mass spectrometry today. Let's look at it. So remember, like I said, in mass spectrometry, it's an instrumental technique um, that ultimately gives us the molecular weight of the compound. But from the molecular weight, we can calculate the molecular formula um, using some pretty simple math and de deductive reasoning. But here's an overview of the instrument. The instrument itself is, as you can see from this last picture, a lot of instruments look the same. These are all different instruments, but they look like they're just in like grayish white type boxes. Well, it's what's inside of the box that's important, all of the parts. So for these instruments, they usually have a sample port on the outside. So if you have a pure sample and you have a syringe, here's the plumb bob of the syringe, okay? You can fill your syringe with a very small amount of material, a cup, maybe a microliter of solution, um, or a pure substance, and you're going to push that into the sample port, and from here, the sample um, becomes vaporized. It's at low, va um, low pressure. It's in usually a vacuum system, so the molecules kind of enter the vapor phase, very far apart. Now, these molecules are neutral when they enter. They don't have a charge. The molecules are going to be drawn into the instrument, um, which is all enclosed kind of in this glass, as you see here, this glass tubing. And so when the molecules are pulled in by the vacuum, um, they um, are drawn through a slit. There's a slit there. The molecular beam can go. And they immediately reach an electron impact type of filament. And this is a filament that is charged to about 70 electron volts, which is enough to remove an electron from a molecule. So if we take a molecule and we remove one electron from that molecule, we're going to ionize it. We're going to create something called a molecular ion. And this is a cation. It's going to have a full positive one charge. It's also going to be a radical. And I'll talk a little bit about more about that on the next slide. But it basically just means instead of having electron pairs, there's going to be a place in the molecule where only one electron exists, like a one electron bond or a one electron lone pair instead of a pair of one electron that's lone. 
Um, so instead of the pair, one of the electrons gets expelled from the molecule. It's gone, and the molecule is now a cation. Now, that this occurs in the ionization chamber, chamber and it's this ionization filament that is going to generate that ion, the molecular ion. It's also called the parent ion, and we'll see why in a second. Now, once that ion is formed, there are always cations in mass spectrometry. It's going to be accelerated through the instrument. How so? Well, over here, let me use a different color, we have some plates. We have this yellow that I'm circling in yellow. We have three different plates here. The one on the left here is called a repeller plate. And the repeller plate is going to have a positive charge because once the molecule, which was neutral to start with, becomes ionized through that filament, beam, the electron beam, the positive charge of the plate will repel the positive charge of the molecule and it will accelerate the molecule forward inside of the instrument. Okay, so it's going to be used as an accelerator. To also help accelerate by coulombic forces are the negatively charged plates on the other side. So we know that positive charge attracts to negative charge, so by coulombic forces of attraction we're accelerating any particles that have been ionized through this chamber. So they will get accelerated through. Now what happens to things, sometimes, you know, it's kind of like a game of dodgeball. Sometimes a molecule can make it through and it hasn't been ionized. It's still the neutral molecule. It, it didn't get hit by the electron beam which pushed an electron out of the molecule. If that's the case, that molecule would not be, um, it would not have been accelerated through the analyzer tube. And usually there's an exit port here that goes to the vacuum trap where a lot of the molecules that kind of just, you know, start, you know, like a regular gas, it just kind of bounces around and eventually gets sucked out of that vacuum port as waste. So only molecules that have positive charge can be accelerated further. All right, so now we're going to be going into the next part of the instruments. We've got the injection port. We've got the ionization tube where we ionize the molecule. <laughs> Over here, we're going to have the sorting tube. This is where we're going to start to sort the molecule. Now, once the, any molecules that are accelerated, they're radical cations. What we're gonna, we talked a little bit about this, but not much yet. We will um, in our radical chapter at the end of the term. But once a molecule becomes a radical, it's not extremely stable. And so that molecule, we've lost an electron now, can further break apart. It's called fragmentation. And the molecule that's the parent, the one whole structure that's the radical cation, can break into pieces of different masses. So we can have like mass A and mass B break apart. And these are, these are called the fragment pieces, um, trying to stabilize that radical cation to make it more stable. So we, we form fragments here in Sometimes people call this the fragmenting tube, but it's the sorting tube as well. Um, and the fragments are usually, I'm going to use a small m for a smaller part of the whole molecule, are usually cations and radicals. Now, once again, cations are repelled by this plate, right? <laughs> I mean, accelerated by this plate, so they will, they will move forward, okay? There's also... Um, so the cations will move forward. They will go all the way down to the detector. So once we get to the exit slit where our detector is, any molecules that make it to the end are going to be detected. And so those are the radical cation because the radical cation has positive charge. But we could also have any of the fragments that have positive charge as well. Now, what do I mean by any of the fragments? If you've got a whole molecule, you can break this compound in different ways. Let's say I have... so many carbons in my molecule. I could fragment here, and that would give a pretty large mass and a small mass. That could be two different masses. I could also fragment here, and that could be a carbon four and a carbon two mass. Or I could fragment evenly, and I could have a three carbon and a three carbon mass, like two masses of equal proportion uh, or masses. So when the molecule fragments, we always get a cation, which is going to be observed. That means it's going to this will be as well, observed, it will make it to the, the detector, as well as some radicals that are gonna, not going to be observed. Those will get 
sucked up into the waist as well, okay? Because they're not going to be accelerated forward. Now, this is where the sorting comes in. Because we know several, the, the molecule that's the main molecule, the parent ion, has the largest mass, fragments are going to have smaller masses. And we can have several types of fragments. So we're going to have several different masses at this point, once fragmentation occurs, flying through our, sometimes it's called the accelerator tube. It's got lots of different names, depending on the text you look at. Um, notice this accelerator tube, this part, the sorting tube, has a bend in the arm. And across that bend, there is a magnet. As you get into physics, too, you'll learn that magnetism and charge are very closely related, and they interact with each other. So if we have a magnet that re attracts, so we've got a positive charge here, okay, if we attract positive charge, kind of like a negatively charged plate would, um, the molecule would bend down and come toward this plate um, if it was stagnant. If uh, the molecule, which had a positive charge, were interacting the other side of the magnet, which kind of represents a positively charged plate, it would also be repelled by that plate and bend away from it in space. Now, these molecules are moving quickly through this magnetic environment. So as the molecules move quickly, instead of attracting to the plate, the side of the arm and sitting there, they fly through at a certain bend. They bend through and that's, you know, the, the magnetic force is what's creating them. The bend in the tube, the, the molecules will change their path. Now it's important to know how things get sorted here. Think about what you've learned in physics about masses that turn in space or are attracted to different forces. If you have a smaller mass, smaller masses make tighter turns and larger masses make less tight turns, right? If, you, if a Corvette and a semi are both driving down the highway at the same speed and they have to make a tight turn, the Corvette, the lighter mass, turns more tightly. The heavier mass turns out more widely. This is where we create the spectrum of masses inside of the instrument. So, um, as you can see, and I'm kind of writing all over this thing now, you, you start having a mass spectrum of different mass pieces here um, at the ion exit slit, which goes to a collector, which gets detected, these different masses do, um, and you'll learn more about that instrumentation, but from the collector, they are sent and they create a mass spectrum. Uh, usually to the, a computer now. It didn't used to be always a computer. It used to be a printout. But now the computer will put up a nice bar graph of a mass spectrum for you. Now let's look at what the mass spectrum shows us. All right. The mass spectrum is going to have some key features. We talked about the instrument a second ago. It had two main parts um, to produce the mass spectrum. It had the ionization chamber where a neutral molecule lost an electron to become a radical cation. Okay, um, also called the molecular ion, if I can spell that right, molecular ion. Sometimes this is called the parent ion because it's the ion before it fragments. So it's the whole molecule minus one electron that gets expelled. So the molecular weight of this ion, if it's detected in the mass spectrometer, equals the molecular weight of the compound because we know that electrons do not weigh very much. So if we can find the largest mass in our mass spectrum, the whole molecule minus one electron, we then know the molecular weight of the compound. And we'll get back to that. Now remember this molecular ion, some of those survive. They get all the way to the detector. But some of them will start to fragment. So in that sorting tube, that's where fragmentation occurred. Um, and usually fragmentation from the molecular ion produces smaller masses of radicals and smaller masses of cations. It will, And you can look in your book if you would like details on what's occurring here. But remember, the cations are the things that reach the detector and are analyzed. So radical cations as well as fragmented cations. The mass spectrometer analyzes cations, and these will be smaller mass pieces. Um, that are found in the spectrum. All right, so here's what the mass spectrum looks like when we get it 
um, when we run an experiment, once the experiment's over, it only takes um, most of the time anywhere from two to ten minutes for most um, experiments to run. The mouse spectrum you'll see is set up kind of like a bar graph. It's got an x-axis here and a y-axis here. And whenever we read graphs, we've learned that we always read y versus x. So let's look at our y-axis. The y-axis is our relative abundance of the molecules. And these are of each, mat, of each cation mass. And so how many of each cation made it to the detector? And then the x-axis is the mz values. mz stands for the mass to charge ratio. Remember, whenever we have a mass of a compound, it always has a positive one charge. So um, the mz ratio is telling us only masses with charges, cations, get to the end of the detector. So for instance, if I had a mass of a piece and it was 102 AMU, that's how much the atoms weighed. And then the charge of that cation, of course, was plus one. Um, that's the mass to charge ratio, 102 AMU for every positive one charge. Well, that basically equals 102 AMU, right? If your charge is always plus one. So um, the x-axis is really telling us, if we interpret this, the masses of our fragments. And the y-axis is telling us how many of that mass made it to the detector relatively. Out of 100%, what percent made it to the detector? All right. Um, so here's an example. Here we have our mz values, and we have a 0. We have, I'm going to deduce this, 5, 10, there's a 15, and 20. And those are in AMU per positive 1 charge. So if I'm looking at a peak on this chart, there's my 20, 15, 10, and 5. It looks like the masses that were detected here were, um, this is 17 AMU per positive 1 charge. This is 16 AMU. Here's a 15 AMU. It's right on that 15. Here's a 14. Here's a 13. Here's a 12. There's going to be a lot of different peaks or signals on your mass spectrum. Are all of the signals going to be important? Well, ultimately, yes, if you're a mass spectrometrist by trade, which means you have a PhD in mass spectrometry, um, or at least a master's in analytical chemistry. Um, for us, though, what are the peaks that we're going to be looking at? We're going to be using this um, to calculate molecular formulas from molecular weights of the compound. So there's going to be a few peaks that are important. The first one I'll talk about is something called the molecular ion. Now, because a lot of computers can't make radical cation symbols, even though we know a molecular ion is a radical cation and it's produced with the cation and the dot representing a single electron, a lot of times in our books, the radical cation is just, or the parent ion, is just given the symbol M. It's just easier to type out. Um, so that is the highest weight in usually in the spectrum. We also have something called a base peak. Now, if you have several peaks on your spectrum, the base peak is the one with the highest abundance. It usually is at, set at 100% relative abundance. So if we look at the spectrum here, um, the most abundant peak that we have is at 16 AMU. Now this is marked the molecular ion. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. But it is also the base peak. This is not always the case. We'll look at another case in a second. Because it's the highest abundance. Out of all of the peaks that made it to the detector, the, the compounds that weighed 16 AMU were the most abundant. 16 AMU. So that's our base peak. Um... And then, oops, we have other peaks that are important as well. Um, so usually the molecular ion is the highest mass peak. But if you find a little blips, sometimes there are peaks higher than the highest mass peak. So that was 16 AMU. Here we're at 17 AMU. And we see a little blip, about 1% the size of my 16 AMU peak. That is called um, an isotopic peak. This is an M plus 1 peak because it's one mass higher than my molecular ion. This is 17 AMU. 
Um, usually carbon will have very tiny n plus one peaks. So this whole thing here is kind of the molecular ion pattern. This is the molecular weight of the molecule, which is 16 AMU. And this is an this is the molecular weight of the molecule plus one extra AMU for a possible isotope. For example, if instead of having all carbon 12s in our sample, one of our isotopes was carbon 13, that would weigh more. We'll talk about that a little more in a little bit, okay? We're just learning how to read the graph right now. Now, most of the time our graphs look like this for mass spectrometry. But like most bar graphs that are made in Excel or something, right, where it's an X and Y plot, we could also put it back in tabular form. So you should also be able to read the MZ values, this is my x-axis, and my relative abundance, my y-axis, in the tabular form as well. This is analogous data. It's the same data in different form. So notice we have all our MZ values. The lowest mass um, peak was 12 AMU. The highest was 17. Now, the 16 peak, that's our highest mass at a pretty high abundance. These are my molecular ion peaks. And this is my M plus one peak. We'll talk more about that. When we come over to the Y axis, we're always looking for the most abundant peak. And that is our base peak. The base peak always has 100% relative abundance. So our base peak is at 16 AMU. Because that is the most abundant peak. So this is how we read a mass spectrum. Let's go over, oops, <laughs> sorry, and we'll look at an example and read it as well. All right, so here's a mass spectrum of hexane. So we know hexane is C6H14. Here's the neutral molecule um, of hexane, our neutral molecule. And if we put that molecule inside of a mass spec and it undergoes electron in impact bombardment will lose an electron from this molecule and that's kind of the equivalent of if you have a two electron bond and this could be in any of the bonds carbon carbon and carbon hydrogen bonds are all have um equal strength so if an electron beam bombards that it would kick one of these electrons out it could be a cc or a ch bond so any electron in this molecule could be kicked out. And at that point, you would have a one electron bond. A one electron bond instead of a two electron bond is a radical bond. Radical means lone electron, okay? And so if we've lost an electron, then we'd have a plus one half charge on one carbon and a plus one half on the other. Now this can occur at any carbon. It can occur between the middle carbon-carbon bonds, it could occur over here, it could occur over here. Um, ionization can take place anywhere, which will impact where fragmentation takes place. So this is why we see a lot of different fragments in our spectrum, because ionization of carbon-carbon and carbon-hydrogen bonds can occur in a lot of different places. The, it's, like, it's like playing a game of dodgeball, and hexane's trying to make it through the electron beam without getting one of its electrons knocked out. Every once in a while, one of the electrons will get knocked out. And so this is what we call the radical cation. Most of the time, if it's a hydrocarbon, we just put it in our cage. But here's our molecular ion. Now, this is the whole molecule, the parent ion, that has a certain molecular weight. Now, if we look up here, the molecular weight's already calculated for us. If you were to calculate using nominal masses the molecular weight of this compound, it would be 86 AMU. So if the molecule weighs 86 AMU, the neutral molecule, okay, um, the molecular ion will also weigh 60 AMU per positive charge, in, one positive charge encountered. We call that the M MZ value, the mass to charge ratio. So if we look on our mass spectrum of hexane, we pump hexane in, we press start, we let the experiment take place, and this is the spectrum that pops up. On our x-axis, where our mz's are, we go from lower to higher masses, and our, our molecular ions should be at the highest end on masses. So I look for high clusters, and I see a very, um, the highest mass cluster is over here around 85. Do y'all see that? Around 85, we've got this cluster of different fragments. 
or masses. Okay, within that cluster, we see this tall peak there. That is going to be, it's at eight, this 85, so it's at 86 AMU. This is our molecular ion. At 86 AMU. Um, that's the mass of the molecule. That's the molecular weight of hexane. So if I wanted to know how much a compound weighed, I put it in the mass spec, I find my highest mass cluster, and from that I find my main peak. That is my molecular ion. Okay, now there's some peaks a little bit up. Remember those little peak that was a blip there? That's an isotopic peak. It has one mass unit higher, so instead of 86, it's 87. This is the M plus 1 peak at 87 AMU. And we'll get into that, what that means a little bit later. All right. So we found our molecular ion, we find our, found our higher isotope peak that can sometimes occur. Now we need to find our base peak. Out of all of the peaks on the spectrum, we've got, we've got about four different clusters here. No, five, we've got five different clusters of masses. Usually they occur in clusters. I can see that right here around 55 to 60 AMU, um, I have a very tall peak and it's the tallest. It's at 100% abundance. And if I come back down and look at what the AMU, what the mass of that peak is, it looks like 55, 50, it's at 57 AMU, okay? So this is called the base peak. It's our most abundant peak. And what do we say this was, 57 AMU? That's its MZ value. Um, now, what does it mean to be a base peak? Base peaks, um, usually, if you go on to study mass spectrometry, they will tell the chemist something. Um, usually, either this is the most stable cation, and we know about carbocation stability. Tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary, which are more stable than primary, right? Um, so, a lot of times, the base peak tells us, out of all the different fragments that could have formed, which one is the most stable cation? And so that was the most stable cation at 57. It's probably um, a more substituted carbocation because we know these are all cations. But sometimes it doesn't have to do with stability. Sometimes it has to do with probabilities. If I have a molecule, and a molecule has methyl groups branching all over it, okay, just tons of methyl groups. <laughs> I'm just going to put methyl groups on this thing. Then the, you know, think about fragmenting this. The possibility of fragmenting off a methyl group because you have so many of them becomes very high, then it's more of a probability factor. So sometimes the molecular ion is high because of what, how many times something can be fragmented. So several of the same um, branches. But anyway, these are the common peaks that we're going to look for. We're going to look for our molecular ion peak. It's the highest mass cluster, that common peak. We're gonna look for our isotopic peaks. They have one, usually one or two mass units higher than molecular ion, but usually they're not higher in abundance. And then we have our base peak, the most abundant peak. So those are gonna be what we read for interpretation of the data. All right, what do the masses mean? All the way back when you were in Gen Chem, or probably before, maybe even in high school, you talked about how on the periodic table, you have all these different elements, hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and so on and so forth. And we said that it's the number of protons in the nucleus that defines the atom, like carbon always has its atomic number six. Every carbon atom has six protons in the nucleus. But we can have different isotopes of carbon because while carbon always has six protons in its nucleus, its number of neutrons can vary. So if a carbon inside of its nucleus has six neutrons, then the total mass number of that isotope is 12. A carbon-12 atom has six protons and six neutrons. But, and that's the most common isotope. Car carbon can also be a carbon-13 isotope though. Instead of having just six protons and six neutrons in its nucleus, it can have one extra neutron. And so it's a heavier isotope. It's got one more neutron in its nucleus. Um, well, we know that some elements do have isotopes and some do not. Um, so this is a, a chart of the different isotopes of the common elements found in organic chemistry, as well as their natural abundances, which means if I have a sample of that element, 
what percents of them are always the lower mass versus the higher mass. So if we look at carbon first, carbon's most abundant isotope is carbon-12. It's nine, about 99% in abundance. And carbon-13, which is one mass unit higher, is only about a 1% abundance. So when we go to calculate the molecular weight in atomic mass, okay, units, um, of a molecule, if the molecule has carbons, we're going to use for our nominal mass, the mass we use to calculate um, our total mass of our molecule, we're going to use the most abundant isotope and its AMU weight. So for carbon, its most abundant isotope is carbon-12. So we're going to say for the molecular ion, to calculate that molecular ion, every carbon weighs 12 AMU. Hydrogen's the same way. Hydrogen has two isotopes. It has a very abundant hydrogen-1 isotope, but the deuterium, the H2 isotope, is very minimal. It's hard. It's hardly exist at all. In 100 atoms, you'd be lucky if you find one. So in the most abundant isotope for hydrogen is hydrogen-1, and so we say when we calculate the molecular weight of the molecule for the molecular ion that each hydrogen weighs 1 AMU. Now if we look at nitrogen, nitrogen's most abundant isotope is a nitrogen-14. So we're going to give that 14 AMU. And then it has a very small abundance of an M plus 1, the N15 atom. Okay, when we get to oxygen, same thing's true. Oxygen has three isotopes, but one of them is a major isotope. It's the oxygen-16. So we're going to give it 16 AMU. If you have oxygen in your sample, most of the time it's oxygen-16 due to its abundance, right? All right, sulfur is the same way. Sulfur's major or most abundant peak is a sulfur-32 atom. So every time you have a sulfur in your compound, it's going to weigh 32 AMU. Fluorine is interesting because fluorine only has one isotope. Um, it only has the isotope fluorine-19. So fluorine will always weigh 19 AMU. It will not ever be substituted out with a higher mass. It doesn't have any higher mass isotopes. Now, when we get to chlorine, things start to get interesting. Chlorine has a major isotope, chlorine-35. And so that's the one we'll use to calculate molecular ions, 35 AMU. But it also has an M plus 2 isotope, an isotope two mass units higher, two more neutrons. It's a chlorine-37. So two mass units higher, we have a 37 AMU um, compound or, or isotope. So for our molecular ion, we would use the atomic mass 35 to calculate that. 37 to calculate the M plus 2 peak, meaning the peak that's a little bit higher due to an isotope. Look at that, about 25% abundance. Now let's look at the abundance ratios here for chlorine and its two isotopes. The reason we're so interested in this M plus 2 now is that instead of having maybe 1 to 5% of a higher mass isotope that's less abundant, we now have a very high abundance of our secondary isotope. Here we have about a 75 to 25% in abundance, which is roughly 3 to 1. 75 to 25 is a 3 to 1 ratio. Now what that means is every time I have a chlorine in my molecule, whenever I go to look at my molecular ion, I'm always going to have the molecular ion peak, which contains my chlorine 35 in it. Let's say if I have like uh, chloropropane, okay, then I would have all the propane atoms, but there would be a chlorine in there. But then two mass units higher, I would have a chlorine 37 isotope about a third of the height. And we'll see that in a little bit. See, one, two, three, because it's a three to one abundance of those isotopes. So there would be a high probability of finding the chlorine 37 in my sample. All right, the next isotope that's also interesting is bromine. Bromine has an abundant isotope. It's bromine 79. So it, if you want to calculate the molecular ion, how much your molecule weighs in AMU, 
um, you would use the 79 for bromine. But if we look here, bromine has an M plus 2 peak that is very high in abundance. Notice here we're about 51 to 49 percent. I'm rounding for our bromine 81. Bromine 81 is two mass units higher. So that is a very abundant secondary isotope. So when we're calculating our molecular ion, we use the most abundant isotope. But if we're going to look on the mass spec, if our compound contains bromine, there's a high probability we're going to find the bromine 81 in the molecule because it's so abundant. The, the, 50, the 51 to 49 is relatively a one-to-one -one ratio of those isotopes in my sample. So if I had a hydrocarbon sample with bromine in it now, if I'm looking at the MZ values on my mass spec, okay, when I go down to my molecular ion, I'm going to see my molecular ion peak because that will have my bromine 79 in it. But then once again, two mass units higher, I will have a bromine 81 peak because if my bromine was 81 and 7 to 79, I will have an M plus 2 peak and it will be about a 1 to 1 ratio. So they'll kind of be like twin towers, equal in intensity on that mass spec. This is called an isotope effect. We're going to go back and look at it a little bit more in detail in a little bit. I want to show you iodine though too. Um, so fluorine, remember fluorine doesn't have any other isotopes. So the fact that fluorine only has an M value, if you knew you had a halogen in your sample, um, if it only had a molecular ion and no higher peak uh, isotopes uh, anomalies, then you would say, oh, it must be a fluorine. Uh, chlorine has the 3 to 1 ratio. Bromine has a 1 to 1 ratio. And then if you have an iodine in your sample, it also does not have any other peaks. So iodine, iodine, I'm sorry, it's only um, stable isotope is iodine-127. So every time you have an iodine, it weighs 127 AMU. So wow, that is a very high atomic mass, <laughs> right? Versus fluorine. Um, so if you had a sample and it had a fluorine in one and iodide in the other, while both of them would only show molecular ion peaks because they don't have any other 